Yeah, right. We're still getting 100 leptons to the drachma, which is okay in the sense that it's not really wrong, but we hope that most of this classical stuff will come out in the wash and we can get down to the renormal. You're always going to see different shit once you get everything under the light. You just differentiate, that's all. No shadows of this scale, of course. You got these black interstices you're looking at? We know now that the continua don't actually continue. That there ain't no linear, Laura. However you cook it down, it's going to finally come to periodicity. Of course, the light won't subtend at this level. Won't reach from shore to shore, in a manner of speaking. So what is it that's in the in-between that you'd like to mess with, but can't see because of the aforementioned difficulties? Dunno. What's that you say? Not much help. How come this and how come that? I don't know. How come sheep don't shrink in the rain? We're working without a net here. Where there's no space, you can't extrapolate. Where would you go? You send stuff out, but, but you don't know where it's been when you get it back. All right. No need to get your knickers in a twist. You just need to knuckle down and do some by God calculating. That's where you come in. You got stuff here that is maybe just virtual and maybe not, but still the rules have got to be in it. Or you tell me where the fuck are the rules located. Which, of course, is what we're after, Alice. The blessed to be Jesus rules. You put everything in a jar, and then you name the jar, and you go from there, a la the girdle and church crowd, and in the meantime, real stuff, which is probably just some substrate of the substrate, is hauling us off down the road at deformable speeds with the provision that what has no mass, has no volume variant, or otherwise, and therefore no shape, and what can't flatten, can't inflate, and vice versa in the best commutative tradition, and at this point, to borrow a term, we're stuck, right? You don't know what you're talking about. It's all gibberish. A little bit of the somewhat opening to Cormac McCarthy's, I imagine, final um, novel or duo of novels from 2022. So this review is going to be about both of them. They sort of come as a pair, even though the publishers and some people argue that they're sort of separate units. We will get to that. But this is about the 2022 book, The Passenger, and also Stella Maris. Now, I, um, as, as many of you know, I'm a big fan of Cool Mac McCarthy. He's probably my favorite author. And I initially did want to do this review when the books were released because it was a big deal these books being released was a huge deal and you know as soon as they arrived i didn't even wait for the the set of two as soon as they arrived i just sat down and read them straight through and like many other cormac uh, cormac mccarthy uh fans I was stumped. I was absolutely stumped with what really to do with these books and how to speak about them. Um, and I've left it a long time. So it's been roughly about a year or so um, since I've now... I've reread Stella Maris in the meantime, but I hadn't reread The Passenger. And I left it a, lot, a long time. And since then, a lot of these books has really... has just been idling away in my subconscious. What was... McCarthy up to with especially the passenger what is he doing with the passenger it is one of the most complex singular and detailed and complex but possibly not complex novels I've ever read and I would and I can't think of a, a greater novel to use the word singular for me my first thoughts on The Passenger when I first read it were that this is something that has finally fractured the the lulls of postmodernism. This is finally something that has cured a drought that has been around for a long time. Um, extremely courageous. Even though it arguably uses many of the tools and methods of what we consider postmodernism, metatextuality, the blending of fiction fiction and fact, uh, the fragmented novel, the, the quite literally fragmented dialogues that intersperse with one another. I mean, this is, um, 
this could be described as a postmodern novel, but I, I don't think it can be. Um, so what I'm going to do, as I usually do with these reviews, is go through the plot in, in the simplest way possible. Now, with with both of these books, it's kind of difficult. It really is difficult. So I've, I have just got the basic plot, which you'll find online. I, as, as, as I understand it, there is yet to be a chapter-by-chapter uh, chapter detailed commentary slash you know, plot analysis online, not that I could find. The, the, here's the thing. The review will be fragmented. It will be dispersed. It will be probably chaotic because the and it will focus about 80 percent on the passenger and less so on Stella Maris and I'll get to why um uh the Stella Maris, Stella Maris is just this very sad um connection which then brings the passenger a new light and I'll bring it in when it needs to be I won't be reading as many quotes from Stella Maris because it's almost like infinitely quotable um but I will get to why that is but this review will be very fragmented because the passenger is very fragmented. But what is the passenger about? Okay, like in simple terms, firstly, it's just, it's not linear in, in any sense. It's not linear. It flicks between uh, Bobby Weston, who is a salvage diver across the Gulf of Mexico, and Alicia Weston, who is the protagonist for the proto sequel Stella Maris and, and Stella Maris is just a uh, is a bunch of dialogues between Alicia Weston and her therapist completely detached from anything else it's all it is with with only one page of uh, description which is about the place where she is which is a Stella Maris uh, sort of hospice um, but back to the back to the passenger passenger flicks between Bobby Weston and Alicia Weston, what's going on in their story? So, it, it it follows Bobby Weston, okay, a salvage diver across the Gulf of Mexico uh, and the South. He um, he's haunted by his father's contributions to the development of the atomic bomb. Uh, this theme that uh, does sort of recur both empirically and abstractly throughout McCarthy's work, um, most notably at um, the end of Cities of the Plain, this great chasm opening up in the world and entering us into this new age that finally sort of ends the the, the Western um, thematics of the, that McCarthy was often writing about. Um, he's, he's, he's tormented by his father's contributions, that haunted by him. He's also tormented by his inability to save his sister, Alicia, um, who we understand committed suicide, and right at the beginning of the book, we see this. We see the suicide, and um, it's this opening suicide really goes back to very early McCarthy type prose. It, it almost reminds you it, was, it could be a passage ripped from one of the westerns. Um, so this suicide, which happened to take place a decade before the passenger, okay. Alicia uh, was a mathematics prodigy, we understand, uh, in The Passenger, so you would read The Passenger first. Alicia was a mathematics prodigy who worked under the tutelage of uh, Alexander uh, Grotendiak, I believe it's pronounced, who was a real mathematician, um, who was probably the most influential and important mathematician, I believe, of probably the, like, the last hundred years. I don't know maths history that well, but it's understood that he is intensely influential um, and sort of had an, you know, not too many mathematicians have that, uh, have an output even close to that other than someone like Euler. Um, but eventually he, he, Grotendiak shunned the field, and if you, uh, the field of mathematics, and if you look up photos of Grotendiak at, uh, at uh, the end of his life, I mean, he lit literally looks like a monk, a uh, full recluse. So that was, in this fictional story, that's who Alicia then studied under. The, uh, the Western siblings, they, Alicia and Bobby, they grew up uh, in East Tennessee um, as their father worked at Oak Ridge on the Manhattan Project with Oppenheimer. Um, there is this intense um, atmosphere of intelligence that is reaching beyond the bounds of human and what to do when language and intelligence goes beyond our bounds of understanding. We're just working in this almost scientifico mystic space of peculiarity okay both of them are math prodigies uh, alicia studies at the university of chicago and she sort of she pushes away physics and eventually moves into mass 
maths while Bobby drops out of Caltech to pursue a career as a Formula 2 race car driver in Europe, uh, where a serious crash puts him in a temporary coma and ends his, ends his driving career. But he has more of a focus on physics, and this is something I'll get to much later. The events of this, of, of really you don't hear too much of Alicia with, with empirically, like in Bobby's, uh, Bobby's story, except in this extremely deep and haunting way that he just misses her and, and his love for her um, is, is what really um, carries the novel along. It's, it, it, once, it's, once it's planted, which McCarthy does expertly very quickly, um, it never leaves. But the novels then are punctuated with these short uh, chapters that are in italics um, about Alicia's treatment for schizophrenia um, and really her life just sat, sat around in motels and not all that nice places due to hallucinations. And um, she hallucinates a fair amount of figures, but the primary figure of her hallucinations is a deformed... a deformed figure called the Thalidomide Kid, who very quickly is just called the Kid, which I'll get to. And he perpetually teases and belittles her and summons other ghostly cohorts to, which or horts as she calls them, to perform or fail to perform these unwanted and garish entertainment acts. There's a, always this constant theme of this failure to actually really entertain or for anything to really come to a come to a fruition. And um, following. Going back to the passenger, following a salvage dive to recover any survivors from a submerged airplane, Bobby discovers that the pilot's flight bag and the, the data box are missing. And within a few days, he returns to his apartment to find two agents of some kind who ask questions about this submerged airplane. This is really where the, after the little suicide scene right at the start, which is like a prose piece, we go into this strange sunken plane wreck. Bobby and then this weird conspiracy feeling and parent just peppered with paranoia everywhere and horror. There's a palpable sense of paranoia, horror, anguish and regret throughout the whole thing. And um, people ask Bobby about some questions about the submerged airplane and the missing items. And Weston, uh, he learns that there was also a missing 10th passenger. Beyond this, beyond this, unless, unless... My reading skills have completely deserted me. The rest of the novel is, is Bobby Weston spending his time in bars and restaurants in these singular rooms with old friends discussing philosophy, science. There's been some criticism about this dialogue because often it's, it's um, a bit shoehorned in. It's like, okay, here's two people who can... Uh, given the means, like given the written means to be able to discuss some things that McCarthy clearly wanted to discuss. And it, it, it should be said that this, that the passenger, McCarthy was working on the passenger and Stella Maris, possibly since the 1970s, but definitely since the 1980s. And it, it does at times come across, I mean, disheveled, but positively in a really good way, disheveled and fragmented. And it, it's a, it's a, you know, I mean, it's complete cliche, but it's a swan song of, science, philosophy, um, truth, beauty, and wisdom. And a lot of these conversations are about that, about how can this be discussed. Okay, And then eventually Bobby, uh, he visits his grandmother in Tennessee. Her house has been ransacked prior, and uh, his father, who sort of haunted him, uh, his research paper and all the family records were taken. And eventually he, he's in hiding from the authorities on the advice of a private investigator who seems very paranoid and almost Pinchonian. Um, he has his Maserati seized and his bank account frozen by the IRS uh, for failing to record this tax money which he in inherited all in cash, which was buried from his grandmother. He's eventually destitute. He drifts across the country as a transient, eventually coming to reside in uh, Formentera. And at the end of the novel can't really spoil it in a way i don't think then i'll you know there's a there's a tiny paragraph at the end that, that adds some oddities in but at the end of the novel bobby weston lies in his bed in a windmill penning uh, a letter to his sister to alicia the love of his life and he's forgotten her face and he believes he will see it again when he dies 
So it's it's really difficult to describe the plot. It's truly very, very difficult to describe to describe the plot of this book and how it all works together. But there's something else I want to mention. There's two things actually I need to mention before even beginning a remote analysis or review of this book. And it's from it's from another philosopher who is working philosophically with topology called Michel Serre, who if you listen to the podcast, you'll know uh, I've done a lot of interviews and talks on Serre. And the reason I want to mention this quote from Serre is I just think it's so completely key. Well, in my own understanding of how this book has been formed, this book that for this book that for f over forty years McCarthy was clearly working on with the keen eye of just a genius and trying to find a means to give his readers to give the world his thoughts and so many things. And the passenger does it in one way, and Stella Maris does it in a more straightforward way of just talks. Um, um, with this overarching, if there's any overarching theme. It's about mystery. It's about deceiving appearances. It's about what do we really know? You know? It's about even with all this information, with all this data, with all this knowledge, there's still this great looming, burgeoning mystery behind all things. And maybe the ultimate theme is maybe you don't get to know. Why, you know, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to do that to yourself? Why do you want to ruin everything? You don't get to know. And what it is to be human is to have to sit with with what it is to not know the mystery. What it really is, I think, for McCarthy to be human is to have knowledge of the mystery, is to have knowledge that the mystery is a mystery, that to even have maybe knowledge that the mystery is a mystery that can be worked out, but is always, with all those things, to also have the knowledge that you're never going to figure it out. And it's all of that at once, which is this horrid, um, horrid, paranoid, potent sort of human human uh human place of suffering but one of the, the quote i want to bring in is from michel Serre, and it's from his um book conversations on science culture and time and he says this if you take a handkerchief and spread it out in order to iron it so you have a flat handkerchief uh, take a piece of paper and uh you you know it was a handkerchief you iron it he says, if you sketch a circle in one area, you can mark out nearby points and measure off far off distances. Then take the same handkerchief and crumple it. Okay? So you might have a grid or some points on this, uh, on this handkerchief, on this map, on this topology, on this territory. Let's stick with topology, the study of maps and surfaces, vectors, points, distances. And if they're mapped out as their distances between them, their proximities and if you crumple it up by putting it in your pocket or by doing what i just did by crumpling up two he says two distant points suddenly suddenly are close even superimposed if further you tear it in certain places two points that were close can become very distant this science of nearness and rifts is called topology while the science of stable and well-defined distances is called metrical geometry. Classical time is related to geometry, having nothing to do with space, as Bergson pointed out, all too briefly, but with metrics. On the contrary, take your inspiration from topology, and perhaps you will discover the rigidity of those proximities and distances you consider arbitrary. And their simplicity in the literal sense of the word, ply, fold, it's simply the difference between topology the handkerchief is folded, crumpled, shredded, and geometry. The fabric is ironed out flat. Sketch on the handkerchief some perpendicular networks like Cartesian coordinates, and you will define the distances. But if you fold it, the distance from Paris, uh, Madrid to Paris could suddenly be wiped out, while on the other hand, the distance from Vincennes to Colombes could become infinite. Why do I think this, this quote on topology is so important? Because to me, you know, let's... Um, Let's take this, this piece of paper that, that Sarah was on about, right? Um, and you take it again, right? And, I don't know, you iron it out, right? What do you have? Once again, you have that linearity. Well, we were here, and then we went to here, then we went to here, you know? I mean, look, 
I don't want, I didn't want this to be too obvious, but this is the way I've been thinking about how McCarthy has been working here, and other people have pointed this out. Let's take uh, the Orchard Keeper, Child of God. Um, I'm going to forget all of McCarthy's books, even though I've read them all many times. Let's take, you know, the linearity of McCarthy's literary history, all those. Let's take, you know, if we think about the early novels, then the westerns, then Sutri with the, 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 the biographical elements, and then The Road, uh, and then something like No Country for All Men, which there's a lot of in this book. You take these all as a linearity and you go, I can see the, I can see the evolution, I can see this. But, but once again, that, is, uh, that, is, that would be a metrical geometry of McCarthy's literary biography and history. And what The Passenger is, is, bang, all those points turn into this um dare i say it even though um sarah would say it's topology the science of nearness and nearness and rifts so all of a sudden sutri is folded into no country for old men you know the, there's so much sutri in this book but there's also so much no country for old men but then right at the start we see this like this this harking back to the westerns to blood Meridian. what's going on it's the difference between topology folded crumpled shredded and geometry it's not this this is not a flat book this book is a crumpled disheveled mess that had to be that way and not only that this notion of shredded is extremely important because if this had been written how it how it should have been written, if this had been written in the geometrical flattened sense it would probably be about four thousand four thousand pages long why to explain the thriller that somehow we all believe is in there but what mccarthy i think has done over time in this sh in this topological shredding has said no you why, why do we need the thriller there's a thriller there but actually it's a thriller without the thriller that makes no sense but it's a thriller without all the elements that, that give you any catharsis of the thriller every now and again there's these little seeds of of a thriller or a horror thrown in but you don't get to see the monster you don't get to see, you don't get the, you don't get the, ah, it was him in the, in the library with the candlestick or whatever, right? It's not that. It's, it's a topological novel. What Stella Maris is, I think, then, just to quickly draw Stella Maris in while I'm talking about it, Stella Maris is this, you know, after, after we have to deal with the topological, chaotic, quantum, metatextual, complex patchwork that is the passenger which is exhausting to read exhausting to read in a really good way and and so detailed and so complex what do we get with Stella Maris we get very very clear points in time you know here's here's a conversation with literally just the temporal conversation in a complete linearity without any complexities of description so you get you get quantum uh, topological mess, good in a good way, and you get classical, possibly even like Newtonian geometric linearity. But it, this is filled with Alicia. Stella Maris is filled with Alicia talking about those problems. So you never get you never <laughs> they're always mixed. But it's like this is like the catharsis, but it doesn't give you catharsis because you now realise that that linearity isn't how things work. After delving into the folded patchwork with all the points of beginning to mix and, 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 and gel and, and merge, you realize linearity can't solve anything. That's the first thing I wanted to say, getting on for 20, 25 minutes. That's how, that's the structure of the book. If you want to know this, yeah, if you want to know the structure of the passenger, it's that, it's a, it's a screwed up piece of paper. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is, which I think is extremely important alongside the topology, is three things combined into one by McCarthy that he, you know, thankfully did in an interview and a paper, which is symbolism, language, and you could say representation, representation in a Kantian sense, which I'll get to. But this is all within the Kukule problem. So, you know, the Kukule problem, you can find it online, it's McCarthy's... Um, only non-fiction paper, I believe. Um, it's it's so fantastic. But, but in short, what the Kukule problem is about, and I'm pretty much speaking verbatim, uh, verbatim what I because I re-listened to the interview by McCarthy last night. What the Kukule problem is about is about August Kukule, um, 
had he couldn't figure out the structure of something and all of a sudden he's asleep and the vision of the ouroboros this the snake that eats its own tail the infinite sort of eating and digesting of 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 reality presents itself to him and he goes ah oh, of course that's the structure of the thing um that he'd been looking for now you know this is just one example of many that mccarthy is on about of what you know to, to use can actually would would sort of call the moment of genius right this 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 thing that happens to basically geniuses we might call it a brain wave or a phase shift where all of a sudden like they the, the the answer is given in the unconscious form you know it's a but it's always a symbol okay so mccarthy asked this question of if the unconscious was able to give to provide august kukule with the symbol of the ouroboros and say like and, and like hint you know that's the thing that's the ouroboros it's a symbol that you're looking for why didn't you just say to him oh the the shape you know like why didn't it why didn't the unconscious literally say to august kukule by the way it's literally this it's you know like actually just speak to him in language and mccarthy's argument is that language is language like as in what i'm doing right now and reading this text on the screen of my notes language has been around for like a th hundred thousand years maybe right it's really new in terms of uh, i guess homo erectus and then homo sapiens it's really new so what was it before that it was it was symbols the unconscious has been there the whole time but it's it, it had to use symbols all the time because we didn't have language language isn't a biological thing and 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 whereas the unconscious speaking in symbols is so symbols are old you know it just it hasn't caught up yet it hasn't caught up yet now why is this important well it's the question that mccarthy talks about of of this notion you know people's people clearly were asking him many many times like where do you get those mean where do you get those words from and i think actually he you know because because he's he's one of the he's one of the greatest writers who ever lived right but he's also one of the greatest just his, his usage of language is so peculiar at times. Like, how did you come up with that? Where did that come from? Right? It's a very clear question that you would ask someone like McCarthy. Like, how did you, I think someone put it as, you know, where'd you get them words, right? But he, I think in, in one of his other interviews, one of his rare interviews, he actually does explicitly state where he gets them from, which is, I don't know. As I'm talking to you right now, this is what he says in the interview as well. I don't know what I'm going to say. And it's like, it's like maybe I could, Maybe I could consciously start to think about the words that I'm going to say to you, but that's not how it works. Where are these coming from? Where's language coming from? Um, you know, how is that developing? Um, maybe there is a philosophy in mind behind it. Maybe there's some psychologists who study it. Maybe, I don't know. But McCarthy has these questions, and could you say, well, you know, it's, it's just words that come from somewhere, language comes from somewhere. But when you when you intersperse this both, I think these these three elements together of where are these things coming from? Why are they being presented as they are to me? And to then recursively talk about the question of where they're coming from is, where's the, like, what's that place they're coming from? And that ties in with the notion of topology in that, well, this isn't all linear. There isn't some, like, linear package manager out there, like a router just, right? And the next thing is, that's Newtonian, right? Newtonian science in the notion of you, you, know, you have maybe, like, a, a, a field of... Um, uh, spheres and then you push one sphere in so it would then have to move the other i mean that's fully classical physics which we've gone beyond whereas topology um in the sense of i'm completely throwing that away topology in the sense of the crumpled handkerchief is all of a sudden well that actually that thing that normally we'd need to go like over here in six steps the linearity well no we we can we can screw it all together and now all of a sudden that's appearing there and i don't really know why and i'm never going to know why um, for those who are interested in this notion of uh, folded time, by the way, in topology, uh, you want to look at the work of uh, point, uh, point care. I should say that. Um, right, those are the three things that I'm going to bring in because um, I think they are the structure that's needed to understand as much as you can what, how this novel is working and what's going on. So... When we just to really try and actually start to get into the novel, the prose style, you know, let's just keep in mind this notion of topology the whole time. It's a topological novel. Um, the prose style, right? It alternates between whimsical, uh, unfunny, 
I've when I first read it, I found it positively unfunny. It's filled to the brim with all these jokes that for me don't land. And on my second reading, they didn't land. There is this horrid humor at times, almost as if, almost as if the, the, the that, that brilliant humor, I mean, that, that perfect humor of Gene Harriger from Sutri has been folded into a place where it doesn't actually, it doesn't really, it's the same humor. It doesn't work now, right? Well, yeah, I always, hang on. We folded Sutri, we folded uh, Sutri into this place. And there's so much such, like I said here, of this, this, no, you know, we're going out with the old boys and we're getting burgers. And do you remember that time? This, this very carefree slapdash, um, darkness that really worked with Sutri, but I feel it's folded in and now it's like, you know, it's down the line. It's 30 years on. It's, that doesn't, that's not funny anymore, man, but, but it's been folded in and that's how life is. That's how things work. There's this notion of, there's this there's this style of despair, there's this whole oil rig scene of complete horror, and all these elements are just suddenly, they're floating in from this map of really McCarthy's career, that's just being folded into itself and crumbling down on itself, okay, and this, I think, this accurately, uh, this, 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 this represents really the key struggles between the two characters because if you really strip it back and i speak about those themes of mystery that's the overarching perhaps existential themes of both the novels is what to do with mystery and what is it to work something out but what is it at its base uh what is it at its foundation if you sort of quickly describe it? it's a love story it's a love story between a brother and a sister uh where, where the love does you know go go it is incestuous love um now, the problem with this, this is that when we talk about how to, we're talking about communication and what it is to connect, what it is to communicate with one another. And when we, you know, the whole thing in this fragmentation, I mean, when we talk about fragmentation, Passenger is mostly about Bobby with these interspersed elements um, back in time with Alicia. And then we have this other book. So, I mean, McCarthy has fractured the two of them you know in a way it's bobby and alicia and they've been fractured and there are these these um dualisms throughout the book of maths physics dogs cats um many other things um of this how can these how can these naturally intuitive two forms of communication and language that that are deeply in love by something that's just outside of them and possibly a bonding through their trauma, through their haunting by their father. But at the same time, this complete bonding is ever fractured because they both approach life with a form of communication that is inherently different to the other. And that inability to, to really get across, to truly understand the other, which is like a Wittgensteinian problem that McCarthy has always, as I think always been dealing with, been dealing with in a lot of his work, is fully there with the love story of, of Bobby and Alicia. This inability, especially on Bobby Weston's part, to fully understand the sister that he, he just absolutely um, loves, loves without measure. And I think this is where, this is where the kid comes in for me. This is where the kid is important. So, the um the thalidomide kid is um thalidomide was a, a drug that was for those that don't know thalidomide was a drug that was i can't remember the year i think it was 70s or 80s a drug that was for a very short time patented and given to women that were, and it was going to ease all the pains of labor i think i remember that right sorry for not and then what happened was that when the children were born from the women who'd taken thalidomide during pregnancy. They were born without uh, arms and legs, um, and it might have been other uh, biological problems that have come from that. But and and calling him the thalidomide kid, I don't, you know, there's more to him than just being specifically. <laughs> obviously, there's more to the thalidomide kid than just being a, a product of. Um, a thalidomide as a mother who took thalidomide i mean firstly he's a schizophrenic hallucination of alicia but the, the thalidomide kid is this this dwarf with flippers and a, a sort of horrible mat of hair and he's he's not nice he's one of the most potently horrid and um pushy and claustrophobic characters you just want him to leave 
and he he always enters in this way that's just like just you don't no one asked you to be here but the thing with the thalidomide kid when it goes back to this notion of topology okay so the first person i believe to point this out and it i think it's evident for anyone who's read mccarthy's work and mccarthy would not do this without good reason is the thalidomide kid is only called the thalidomide kid in full twice throughout the whole of the passenger which is fairly long for a, i mean in the paperback version it's uh, we're getting on for about 400 pages just over 400 pages he's called the thalidomide kid kid twice okay firstly when he's first ever introduced and then way later all the other times he's referred to and almost immediately straight after being saying oh here's the thalidomide kid he's called the kid and anyone who's read of course blood meridian and in a way uh, the the road with the child but mostly blood meridian will understand this the kid is is the protagonist of blood meridian the kid is this you know very cliche this story of is does what happens to the, the we're following the kid's journey for a while but though even though he disappears for a long time in blood meridian is he redeemed what happens to him at the end does he you know does he subsume the judge into him what what is the kid and the fact that the kid is now reintroduced in the passenger is for me one of these foldings of topology it is a it is something that is in the noumenal is in you know the the, the what arthur mack might call the twilight or or there's so many names for this other zone this zone of genius that is coming in that we can't help this topological zone of folding and uh, this is john jeremiah sullivan noted he was the first to know i believe um that uh, this is in one of his early reviews of the book that and he said um that the kid of the passenger may represent a zombified summoning of the earlier kid from blood meridian only in this incarnation he has witnessed the 20th century and has been thoroughly damaged by it okay and so the kid much like the humor for me from Sutri coming in it's almost like it doesn't you don't belong here of course you don't belong you're a, you're a you're a schizophrenic hallucination but like these for me the kid and the passenger the passage uh, the passages of eating burgers hey man we'll have a burger and a beer and a you know we're going to shoot the breeze in a in a restaurant so it doesn't belong now and much like the kid being brought in from this topological folding has become mutated has become um brutalized and has become in in itself disgusting and abrasive and unfunny and 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 i mean that's the main thing to me it's unf it's not funny anymore um and he he uh the, the kid that's why i began with that quotation from page 10 um begins with this like just this unfolding of the side of alicia weston because of course he is a hallucination it's acknowledged that he's a, a, a schizophrenic hallucination of Alicia Weston, and he notes at certain points that he's he's writing things down in these little weird notebooks that he's tucking away in the drawers. And he sort of says something along to paraphrase. He says something along along the lines of, "You know, what's yours is mine," basically, which is, of course, I mean, what a horrible joke to make. He is her mind, but he also represents quite literally, like literally in himself, with that passage of gibberish, that side of her which is sort of broken off and. You know, when we think about pure mathematics, when we begin to think about mathematics in general, like we think about number, like where the hell is a number? What the hell has that got to do with my empirical real world? He's he's ended up being this absolute fragmentation of what the what the fuck happens when intelligence and knowledge is and that genius that's being folded into such an outside just cannot be contained within a human vessel. And this this like splitting off happens and it's horrible. And he, the kid himself, is then just firing out this physics and math infused wordplay, which Alicia, who of course is containing the kid, says is gibberish. So he's just like this, this uh almost like a surreal at certain times a surrealist uh almost like a with this futurist vitality a surrealist exposition not uh, exposition like i've just got to get this out i have no idea what this is that's coming in i have no idea okay you know we and it just peppered with you know this is topology on topology on topology because it's he's not coming at it specifically from a physics angle as you as you 
as, as, a, as you would understand from the passage that I read out, that itself is folded in with all these absolute, like, annoying cliches. You know, um, uh, the, the, just he constantly, we know now that the continuer don't actually continue. There ain't no linear law. Like, he's constantly having this really annoying, childish wordplay. Um, and th there is one uh, argument I found online uh, and one like you have to really carefully read this that what he's really talking about when he's trying to go through this notion of linearity once again the topology I wish I hadn't oh it's right there I wish I hadn't thrown it away what he's talking about in this early scene of gibberish and what I think Pat possibly what the kid is trying to be if he's ever going to be helpful and what Alicia really would love to do is just to it's almost a a scientific, it would be a scientific philosophical catharsis in that, and what McCarthy, I think, would say, maybe this would be what, what unfolds, quite literally unfolds the mystery of all things is, this is how life is, right? It's the topological map of everything folding into itself, whether you like it or not. Your, your memories that our memory fa faculty is crap, basically. Your memories, your experiences, everything is constantly infolding. The past is always ahead of you. The future is behind you. Everything's infolding. And what the kid is on about in this earlier section is, what if we, you know, he's teasing Alessia with, what if we could take this sort of very traumatic, horrid, mysterious life and this difficulty of love and, and all this infolding and this mystery, and what if we could suddenly just unfold it and iron it out again? But that's never going to happen. And then if you, if you unfolded it and ironed it out again, maybe you could take one point, you could finally... You finally go back to one of your memories and you can really look at it objectively, okay? And that's what so many people want to do with the passenger, right? Is people want to take the passenger and go, you know, right, I'm going to put it, I'm going to put, I'm going to put it in, I'm going to put the mystery in order, I'm going to figure out the mystery, and we'll get to the mystery. I've sort of already hinted at that, but we'll get to the mystery. And that's what they want to do, but you can't do it. Because even when you do, even when you do unfold the mystery, when you unfold and re-iron the topological map that has been crumpled out, what do you get? You get this. And it's hor it's kind of horrible and it's not nice and it's it's linear and stilted and it's like bang 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 and life is not linear like that, right? So this is the kid, and this is what he um this is what he's constantly teasing. And I was gonna read a lot more sections, so I need to get through to that. What was the next one I had? Twenty four was twenty four. Um So with this notion of mystery, okay, after um is it after after the first section with the kid with this gibberish with this with this hints of topological folding okay. we are given um this one of my favorite parts of the book actually we're given this um bobby west and his friend uh euler are going down to the ship to this uh sorry this plane wreck to they are salvaged salvage divers right immediately embodied but bobby Bobby Western sections. I mean, these are lonely. They are haunted by everything. This is a man who is the ultimate, <laughs> um, ultimate forgotten man. You know, the, the, the love lost. He's 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 done. He's going off, and he just wants to. I don't know. Have have this basic job, but it opens with this conspiracy of of the wreckage. You know, where's uh, they both understand intuitively something's not right with the wreckage. It's dark, it's horrible. And then eventually he is um, two sort of almost like men in black chaps uh, <laughs> turn up at his flat and question him about it. And um, it's a th it, you, you enter into this thriller and there's like this excitement. You're like, Ooh, we've, you know, we've, 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 okay, McCarthy's given us the suicide and we know now why the structure's like it is, we know now why the feelings are like they are, we know what's going on with Alicia, we know, oh, but now we've got this conspiracy. But I think the answer to the conspiracy is given, page 24, this is, uh, a friend, his friend Euler, says, sorry, the point is I don't have a story about how that plane got down there, and every time I think about all the things that are wrong, the list gets longer. I think that's McCarthy being pretty damn obvious with us as readers. He wrote a thriller, it doesn't work. Well, well, you know what, like if, if you give someone the, the actual story of how this plane got down there, of how the mystery happened, like is that actually going to answer it for you? No. 
And I think that's, you know, that part of it is answered. It's about something else. It's about them being in this and not really understanding what answer it is they need. Okay. But what makes all of this very uncanny, trying to I'm jumping through with the style here, is something that really stands out to me in this novel. Once again, this is an infolding as well, which is something you uh, maybe there was probably most of this in Sutri due to its biographical elements. But we get through to a very distinctive, and as far as I'm concerned, not very McCarthy-esque, and it stood out to me because of this, um, um, infolding of fact of, honestly, a passage you could probably pull out of a Bret Easton Ellis novel, okay? This is page 28. He detailed his adventures in an offhand way. Pads of forged prescriptions from a print shop in Morristown, Tennessee. Real doctors, but their phone numbers replaced with numbers from payphones and supermarket parking lots. Girlfriend a few feet of feet away in a parked car. Yes, that's correct. His mother is terminal. Yes. Uh, Delaudids. 116th. Three weeks of this in the small towns of the Appalachian South, and then pacing up and back in a room at the Hilltop Motel on Kingston Pike in Knoxville. The room paid for with a stolen credit card waiting for their connection. Half a shoebox full of Schedule II narcotics with a street value of $100,000. He stripped out of his clothes and the heat was pacing save for a pair of ostrich skin boots and a wide-brimmed black borsalino. Smoking his last Monte Cristo. Five o'clock came, then six. Finally a knock at the door, he snatched it open. Where in the hell have you been, he said. But he was staring down the barrel of a thirty-eight caliber service revolver and there was a blunt backup man off to the side with a pump shotgun. The TBI agent was holding up his badge, looking up at this tall and totally naked fellow. Oh, buddy, he said, we got it just uh, just as quick as we could. There's another section about this later on where they're talking about uh, Hoya watches and, and, and brand names. And, well, you know, that's, it's real. Um, there's the locations, there's these specific locations, there's these brand names, there's these Monte Cristos, there's, um, there's all these very explicitly real things. And eventually... There is John Shedden, who was a real-life friend of McCarthy's, who is also folded into this novel. And for people, as I've read online, for people who knew John Shedden, the excerpts about Shedden are pretty much on point with what he was like. You know, McCarthy's not not dramatizing him in any sense. And so all of a sudden, wait, he's folded in from this topology. Like, it's almost like this real character couldn't help but be caught up in the mix, right? And this is like a top a topology of a hundred years in Knoxville, just these characters walking in, so you don't belong anymore. I mean, things are over, right? And what what happens is this because of all this in I'm gonna keep calling it topological infolding, because of all these things folding in, you're like, why is this here? Right? Why like well, John Shedden's here, and now you're mentioning you're mentioning a Monte like a very specific Monte Cristo, and you're mentioning very empirical, you're mentioning exact landmarks. So you, we've now got this like fictional conspiratorial story mixed in with real life landmarks, mixed in with real life people, with this incestuous, paranoid, conspiratorial love story going on. It's a horrible, it's absolutely horrible. But there's this strange section that comes out of nowhere. And I think it's fantastic, right? And it's, it's a, it's sort of a, It's a Vietnam story that's like a that's like a sort of a wet dream of, of Nam stories. I don't mean that in a in a callous way. Okay. All of a sudden, uh, we we have this talk of um, Bobby Weston asking about going uh, going into Nam. You know the the the, the sort of the cliche thing, right? Of, of you find this in films and in movies, uh, sorry, movies and books of this, this, um, you know, the, the haunted war veteran, right? And this, this notion of what happened, you know, what happened in the war that once again, another little thing is folded in this little mystery of war. It's folded in. You look online, people who've been, um, many people on the McCarthy forums, you said that they'd served, you know, they said that this was so extremely accurate description of, of these things. Um, someone else online also pointed out that, um, McCarthy's service would have would have just missed, I believe it's the Vietnam and the Cold War, I might have got that wrong, but just missed that sort of um, 
that right, you know, that right of passage of going to war. And so there's this notion, you know, that like, what happened there? You know, man, like, you know, give, give me something, right? We see this in films and books a lot of this character who's gone to war. And there's always that mystery behind them. what happened in the war. Like, what's, you know, did you kill anyone? Did any, you know, who died? Or how graphic was it? There is this strange mystery. And for about five five or five or eight page five five to eight pages this character suddenly just explicitly says, you know the mystery's gone here's the war story and it ends with this little section where we flew out of Quan uh Quang Nam we'd see these elephants in the clearings and the bulls would back off and raise their trunks and challenge us. Think about that. That's pretty fucking bold. They didn't know what we were. But they were taking care of the old lady, the kids, and here we come along in this gunship armed with these 2.75 rockets. You couldn't fire them too close because the rocket had to travel a certain distance in order to arm itself, to arm the warhead. They weren't even all that accurate. Sometimes the fins wouldn't open, right? They'd go wobbling off like a goddamn balloon. They could go anywhere. So maybe we thought, what the fuck? They've got a chance. But we never missed. They would just blow them up. They'd just fucking explode. I think about that, man. They hadn't done anything. And who are they going to see about it? So that's what I think about. That's why I regret, all right? So he's asking, you know, he's, doing, he's going through the typical thing of regrets and, and, you know, how bad was it? Sort of really a notion of PTSD. And we get this. We get all the mystery of the war story. I mean, we get it explicitly, right? The, the mystery behind those sort of archetypal characters and this sudden Nam story. And there's so many little uh, sort of featurettes of two people talking where you suddenly just get everything, right? Um, there's one later on with Bobby Weston's uh, Bobby Weston's transgender lover, Debussy, talking explicitly about how she feels, about she wants a female soul. And we get these featurettes all throughout. And each and every time, what we get is everything. And this is something I think is key to notice is that the thing that's been folded in, we we get it. You know, here's, here's the cliche norm story that usually is held as a mystery. And here it, here's everything. But what are we left with? We're not. We still the mystery's still there, right? We still we've we, 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 it just doesn't it doesn't it doesn't do do it for us, right? The, the mystery is always going to remain. Um, so that brings us to the to the title, okay? It brings us to the title, which is the passenger, and I think the passenger is a key idea. Um, it reminds me actually when thinking about it a lot of people online's appreciation of the title reminds me of a very early john uh, john bath one of his very early novels called the floating opera and john bath uh, in the floating opera he talks about how if you think about if you were on a river uh, the side of a river and a floating opera came came past at a certain point you're going to be able to see it and hear it at a certain point you're going to be able to see it and not hear it at a certain point, you'll be able to hear it and not see it. And at a certain point, it's gone. Okay. And this notion, I think, ties in well with what the passenger is for McCarthy in a topological sense. It's um, this fleeting thing that got a little bit of the topological enfolding, that got a bit, you got a bit of the mystery, and now it's like, oh, now I'm floating away. I'm a passenger in all this, and now I'm left to deal with the rest of everything, and I never got all the information I needed as I was passing through. And this is key in all of, I think, all of McCarthy's work really is this notion of the forces in the world are actually the ones with the agency and all of McCarthy's characters are passengers who really, they have agency, but it's within a certain limitation of knowledge and they're never going to be able to figure out the mystery that they're in. Um, and 61 was the passenger bit. Um, well, what, yeah, well, what kind of passenger can see you? This is between the Thalidomide kid and Alicia. Well, what kind of passenger can see you? How do we get stuck on this passenger thing? I just want to know. Ask me again. What kind of passenger is it that can see you? Um, and, you know, who do they think we are? I don't know. Christ, I guess they think I'm a passenger. Something fleeting. You know, um, and then later at the end of this this section with the kid, 
But let's see, you're on this notion of the passenger, you're on this notion of passing through it. Good for you. When you carry a child, when you carry a child in your arms, it will turn its head to see where it's going. Not sure why, it's going there anyway. You just need to grab your best hold, that's all. You think that there's these rules about who gets to ride the bus and who gets to be here and who gets to be there. How did you get here? Well, she just rode in on a lunar cycle. I see you looking for tracks in the carpet, but if we can be here at all, we can leave tracks or not. The real issue is that every line is a broken line. You retrace your steps and nothing is familiar. So you turn around to come back, only now you've got the same problem going the other way. Every world line is a discreet and a Kaisura Ford void that is bottomless. Every step traverses death. He turned in his chair and clapped his flippers. All right, God, places. That was because he was setting up a theatrical act um, for, for Alicia there. But every line is a broken line. I mean, it doesn't really get more obvious than that. And the whole, the whole novel is about that. It's about, once again, topology, nonlinearity, about trying to figure, figure out something where you don't have the whole picture and the kid as the representative of look i'm i'm the, 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 almost the the fragmentation of what happens when you don't have that whole picture of of this just this burgeoning problem uh, that has to eventually speak for itself okay um and what you know what are we what are we as readers what are we trying to do there's so many people and it's interesting this is my first response with it my first response to the passenger was um what was that you know what am i trying to was i meant to work something out here was i meant to figure something out is there an is there an answer i don't believe there is you know i think the whole thing is a is is simply that is 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 a the swan song is is that beautiful end piece of you don't you don't get an answer not in this life not the way things work um and the you know we're constantly given either the complete knowledge of something like the nam story where it's completely revealed or we're given these just pinchonian hints of something more happening right like with the the plane wreck you know this this literal conspiracy of people turning up in suits and asking questions but the question stands that, that we can't bear as human beings. What if there isn't a conspiracy? What if, what if there is no mystery? We go back to Blood Meridian. The mystery is that there is no mystery. Okay. Maybe it was that there's a few things that happened that, that really like, oh, something's going on behind the scenes here. Um, Bobby's friend Euler dies. Um, and it's told that it's an accident. He gets his uh, private investigator to investigate a lot of the things that are happening around him, his father's paperwork, uh, his IRS problems, um, but um, and other bits and pieces. And there's this, you know, you, you get caught up in it because of McCarthy's prize, but what if your friend's death was an accident? What if you did commit tax fraud? What if you just, actually, what if the, the banal reality is the reality? And what, what if, we were told that we just refuse to believe it because we want more. We want more mystery. And when we when we're given the whole picture, like we are so many times in the book, I feel that I was left like, huh, okay, well, why did you give me that? Um and where do you go from that? And it's very difficult to go from somewhere from that. And that's why I think it's like it is the fire it is one of the first novels to maybe beat postmodernism in its own game because it, it does enough to say, look, here's all the problems all in one with this folding. And um, you can get caught up in it if you want, but it's a choice. And I don't think the mystery is really there at all. You're just addicted to it in a certain way. You know, Blood Meridian, the full quote from Blood Meridian, I know I put it here. Your heart's desire is to be told some mystery. The mystery is that there is no mystery. Okay. Um, and a few more quotes uh, from the book to read out. Um, uh, da -da 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 -da. Another time, yeah, another point where something's folded in, as far as I'm concerned. He turned and eyed her and then continued to pace. He paid no attention to the other entities. A matched pair of dwarves in little suits with purple cravats and Homburg hats. 
an aging lady in pancake makeup smeared with rouge, antique dress of black, voila, uh, voila, <laughs> graying lace at throat and cuffs. About her neck she wore a stole, assembled out of dead stoats, flat as roadkill, with black glass eyes and blockade noses. She raised a jewelled lorgnette to her eye and peered at the girl from behind her ratty veil. Other figures in the background. A rattle of chains in the far corner of the room where a pair of leashed animals of uncertain taxon rose and circled and lay down again. A light rustling, a cough. As in a theatre, when the house lights dim, she clutched the covers up under her chin. Who are you? she said. And to me, there's enough little hints there. Um, the one specifically, her ratty veil. Reminds me once again, who is arriving here or what is arriving? What is arriving isn't specifics. It's not specific people. It's a certain point. It's a certain uh, atmosphere. Okay. What that reminds me of, that short scene, is the the charge, the famous charge in Blood Meridian, where they're wearing this. They're all wearing the garish suits with the wedding, one of them wearing a wedding veil. And it's like that atmosphere, whatever, whatever possessed those... Uh, the gang, Gladden's gang, I think it was, at that point in time then, it's, it's been folded in and now well, it doesn't fit anymore. And so it has to become this horror, horrible, fra fractured off, um, a schizophrenic entity play. But what McCarthy does with this play is really interesting because it's out of, it's in a way, it's out of time. It's like, it's like it was born here and it's rhizomatic and then it arises again, it's folded in. It's like, like the Sutri thing, okay? It's, uncom it's uncomfortable and it doesn't work. And um, this is something that the kid struggles with, with because I think we're always dealing with in this book of things that are, because they've been folded in, they're out of time, they feel out of place. The horror scenes don't really need to be horror. The conspiracy isn't really a conspiracy. The, the horrible scenes that really are like something out of Blood Meridian, well, they don't have that backdrop anymore. And so the kid always fails at the entertainment. And McCarthy admits to that as well. It's, in a way... <laughs> Dare I say it, even though it's entertaining, it's not an entertaining novel. All the plays that are arranged in the novel, all the featurettes, the kid quite literally arranging one, they always fail to produce. You never like want to applaud. Like it's like, well, wait, what? You know, it's almost like the backdrop, like it's like the set has been painted on card and it's flimsy and then it's and then it's gone. It's a passenger. And um I think that was what McCarthy was, one of the things he's trying to do is that as a linear, if we speak, you know, Kant is another backdrop for this novel, which he speaks to with um, Lawrence Krauss in their last interview. They're making that joke about Kant's thoughts on quantum mechanics. This notion of the phenomena, so, um, well, I'll use the, you know, this is a phenomenal object. That if I move it here through time, uh, there is the space and time, and the, it affords me as a sensing being the linearity. But it's not the what Kant would call this is phenomena. It's not the noumena. It's not ever can be the thing itself because as I utilize my senses to present this object to me, it's actually represented. And so, what's the passenger? The passenger is every human as a linear phenomenal vessel. Well, let's reverse that. To be a human being in the Kantian sense is to be is to be to have a priori space and time, right? For um, uh, with with time in a way coming first, because for any object to move through space, it needs to move through time. So as these these fleshy uh, space bound bodies that are moving through time, um, and in phenomenal vessels, everything is always represented to us. But that new manner, that haunting genius new manner that is constantly folding things into us via some other apparatus um, affords us the position of the passenger of this fleeting like you know how am i meant to ground myself when when the when i am only afforded really a linearity in a linearity that outside of me is built up from a non-linear fragmented uh world that mystery that i just cannot piece together because of how i am and that's what it is to be a passenger, right? Um, there is many, many human elements in this as well. I mean, it, 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 I've, I can't focus on every single aspect of these, um, of, of 
the book at all. I mean, it's literally impossible without like yeah. ten hours. I focus really on on um, the structure and, and and things like that. But I'll do a few more. Um, there's one quote in particular that I want to hear. <clears throat> this is about a third of a way. way. There were people who escaped from Hiroshima and rushed to Nagasaki to see that their loved ones were safe, arriving just in time to be incinerated. He went there after the war with a team of scientists, my father. He said that everything was rusty. Everything looked covered with rust. There were burnt-out shells of trolley cars standing in the street. The glass melted out of the sashes and pooled on the bricks. Seated on the blackened springs, the charred skeletons of the passengers with their clothes and hair gone and their bones hung with blackened strips of flesh. Their eyes boiled from their sockets. Lips and noses burned away, sitting in their seats, laughing. The living walked about, but there was no place to go. They waded by the thousands into the river and died there. They were like incense, insects in that no one direction was preferable to another. Burning people crawled among the corpses like some horror in a vast crematorium. They simply thought that the world had ended. It hardly even occurred to them that it had anything to do with the war. They carried their skin bundled up in their arms before them like wash, that it would not drag in the rubble and ash, and they passed one another mindlessly on their mindless journeyings over the smoking afterground. The sighted no better served than the blind. The news of all this did not even leave the city for two days. Those who survived would often remember these horrors with a certain aesthetic to them, in that mycoidal phantom blooming in the dawn like an evil lotus, and in the melting of solids not heretofore known to do, so stood a truth that would silence poetry a thousand years. Like an immense bladder, they would say. Like some sea thing, wobbling slightly on the near horizon. Then the unspeakable noise. They saw birds in the dawn sky ignite and explode soundlessly, and fall in long arcs earthward like burning party favours. So this is, um, in a way, it's the reference to why the father's work haunts, um, haunts both of them so much because it's just this absolute garish thing. But this notion, um, this notion for McCarthy, but also for I think for, um, for 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 Alicia. And for Bobby, it's the haunting that their, you know, their their lineage in a way has, has, they are in a, in a way they owe that debt that that is something that they've arrived from is is that history from their fathers and all these papers then going missing and this history just becoming disappeared with his work on the Manhattan Project. But at the same time, it's something that haunts McCarthy's work, and I think this. The notion of a, the atomic blast, the atomic bomb, as the ultimate kaisura that suddenly does rip the mystery into uh, into into the nothingness that is behind it, um, and what basically what to do with this absolute um, abortion of human life that is the, the complete split, and we see that at, once again at the end of the cities of the plane where. That a certain era ends as another begins as the atomic blast is seen on the horizon. Here we then see the effects. We 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 see the effects of it in this personal paranoid sense of something so ungodly and inhuman that the human is actually swiftly disappearing from human life. But we also then see its effects on reducing us quite literally to insects once again. It's almost as if the atomic bomb is, if we were to think in Nietzsche in terms of we are meant to progress from animal to man to superman, on our way from man to Superman, we drop an atomic bomb and we are finally reduced to what it is we truly are. Um, um, and so we see that these effects uh, all throughout. And then if you think about the road, even though the road is to do with the, supposedly, I don't think it's ever explicitly mentioned in the novel, I can't remember, it's actually to do with the eruption of the Yellowstone. We can at least imagine that actually the after effects of nuclear war would be something akin to the road. And so this... Um, this almost like the you know the, the spandrel of human existence is that we can absolutely just decimate our survival with intense technological pro, uh, progress um, is our complete uh, Darwinian oversight uh, that we we have the means to do that and so within within all the hu within humanity is is an inherent inhumanity 
Um, and you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but we're left. I think even even people as as marvelous and genius as Alicia are left as passengers in the face of this force. And I think that's why Grotendieck, the mathematician, is brought in because uh, those of you that might want to look into Grotendieck's life, you could also read um, Labatut's. When we cease to understand the world, Labatut talks about Grotendieck and that and this notion of getting to that point, I think, of internalizing, you know, bringing Nietzsche again. I mean, what happened to Nietzsche when he fell out, when he collapsed in Turin in a fit of madness? What was it that finally entered his brain to cause him to, you know, what is it to truly internalize the effects of something like a nuclear bomb? Or for Grotendieck to, you know, to be able to actually have the, appar- the, the biological apparatus to possibly even understand or internalize things that you can't understand it's a, it's a lovecraftian madness and lovecraft is also a direct i think it's clearly a direct influence in this book especially in the horror type sections that lovecraftian notion of uh, knowing that you don't know of seeing the unseeable of internalizing that which you just your apparatus can't do is what the mystery is and after that point it all falls apart and what do you do? I mean, there's many, many instances of what you do in that sense. Um, one one example that's given in the book is back to the Nam story. It said that oh yeah, some people, some people in the middle of the war in Nam just walked out to another country and were never seen again, right? And they found them forty years later in Germany or something, right? This notion of like this, uh, you know, Lovecraftian unspeakable horror, and you just, you just can't do it, shut down, walk away, like the mystery is too much, or the mystery has been ruined. The same with the same with this uh, incinerative blast from the atomic bomb. It's like this, we, how can a human being deal with this? You're reduced to an animal, you're reduced to completely Darwinian uh, faculties, and the mystery has been blitzed into nothingness to start again, in a way. Um, and then for Alicia, I think Alicia is in this strange position where she's She's held on to it. She hasn't just walked away. She hasn't had a complete mental collapse in a way. She's still, she's still, uh, still able to, you know, have these discussions. And then in Stella Maris, go off and talk to uh, the therapist on her on her own accord. But what's happened is, apart from it's fragmented off and has to be the thing that is just the most horrible, unkind, unfunny abomination you can you can the the, the modern abomination right? This this this. As uh, Sullivan said, you know, the, the, the sort of mutated, destroyed remnant of modernity that is a product of pharmaceutical sort of abuse in a way um, and is, is garish and has horrible humour and is constantly trying to just entertain and it just fails. And you're left, you you know, you're left with that. And, um, you know, what, what, what can you... Um, uh, an example of of this sort of horror that's brought with the kid. The inside of the trunk was lined in a sort of paisley material, and the occupant himself was turned out in a little, little suit of the same stuff, coat and trousers, matching vest and cap. He wore a yellow cravat and a silver watch chain from which hung a collection of small medallions, holy medals, school awards, milagros of coin silver, a small seal that bore the name of a milk company. She tucked her robe about her and leaned forward in the bed, the better to see him. He seemed to be a dummy, made of wood. His mouth opened and closed with a clapping sound, and his eyes were bright and glassy. He crouched and put up his fists again, and then stood back and smiled his wooden smile. We don't have the program, the kid said. There's some jacks in the back of his coat and the access panel. We don't know what's missing. Thought he might like to take a gander. He's got a sort of handmade look to him. What do you want me to do? I don't know. Ask him some questions. I'll sit here and take a few notes. What sort of questions? Ask his na- Ask him his name. The mannequin was leaning against the open trunk, with one foot crossed over the other. He looked cocky and slightly dangerous. What's your name? She said. Puddin'Dane. Ask me again, I'll tell you the same. What's your name? Puddin'Dane. Ask me again. Okay, said the kid. I think we got it. What are those things on his watch chain? Woodsman of the world, immaculate conception. There's a Phi Beta Kappa key, probably from a pawn shop. He keeps staring at me. He keeps staring at you? Yes. He's a dummy. I know, he looks familiar. So the kid is, you know, the kid's horrible. I mean, he's sort of like half summoning what is basically just this strange afterthought of the unconscious. This, this horrible wooden dummy that I 
why is he here? Like, we don't even know. Um, and this happens time and time again. Um, and I think this is this is um, with Kant. You know, for the for with with Kant, when you think go back into go back going back to the phenomena and the new manner, Kant had this notion of genius of something coming in which is sort of unexplainable, like a brainwave, like um, you know something too much too much to handle, like the Kukule problem. And I think what needs to be acknowledged and what McCarthy is acknowledging with new, the nuclear bomb, with the Kukule problem, and with with the kid is that the things that arrive from the outside aren't always scientific breakthroughs. They aren't always the symbols that you need. You know, it's not always, ah, okay, thanks for that. I've worked out a problem. Sometimes it's a kid. You know, sometimes it's a nuclear fucking blast. Sometimes the, the genius that arrives is something we just can't comprehend. And schizophrenia is like, really the the opening to that it's like well it's, the cosmos doesn't really care about what you get um and the unconscious doesn't necessarily seem to care what you get and this novel is an opening where the openings just don't work because they shouldn't be there you know Sutri worked when Sutri worked and now it's uncomfortable you know we shouldn't be drinking now we shouldn't be like hanging out with a cheeseburger and a hamburger now it doesn't it's not funny anymore um things are ending you know time's moving forward the blast has happened something is ruptured something's gone wrong like a new form um and everything just does not sit right and it's this conspiratorial paranoid theme and atmosphere that really carries you along because you get caught up in it and then you're left um without without really the catharsis like i said because there is no mystery so with the passenger i'll end with one one quote and then wrap up actually why I, with stella maris why i think it's there is actually this strange hope at the end he moved to a shack out on the dunes just south of Bay Street, Louis. In the evenings, he'd walk the beach, look out over the grey water where skinsy pelicans came labouring down the coast in their slow tandem flights above the offshore swells. Improbable birds. At night, he could see the lights come up along the causeway, lights along the horizon, the slow passing of ships, or the distant lights of the drilling rigs. There was cold water from a cistern at the house, but no electricity. A small cast iron railroad stove in which he burned driftwood. He had no money to buy bottled gas for the cook stove, so he cooked on the wood stove as well. Rice and fish, dried apricots. The day is cool, and he sat on the beach in the raw wind of the gulf, wrapped in an army blanket, read physics, old poetry. Tried to write letters to her. Where he, wa where he walked the tide line at dusk, the last red reaches of the sun fled slowly along the sky to the west, and the tide pools stood like spills of blood. He stopped to look back at his bare footprints, filling with the water one by one. The reefs seemed to move slowly in the last hours, and the late colours of the sun drained away, and then the sudden darkness fell like a foundry shut down for the night. At daybreak, he hiked out through the dunes and up the sandy road to the highway and trudged along the edge of the blacktop looking for dead animals. He skinned them out with a single edge razor blade and carried the raw unstretched hides to the little grocery store two miles down the road. Raccoon and muskrat, once or twice a mink, new trio trails for the bounty. He bought tea and canned milk with the money cooking oil, hot sauce and tin fruit. He carried home dead rabbits from the road that had not been there the day before and cooked and ate them. He washed his clothes in the dishpan and hung them to dry over the poor training. Sometimes they'd blow away down the dunes. On sunny days, he'd walk the beach naked, solitary, silent, lost. Nights he built fires on the beach and sat there wrapped in his blanket. The moon rose over the gulf and the moon's path dished and tilted on the water. Birds flew down the beach in the dark. He didn't know what kind they were. He thought about the passenger, but he never went back out to the islands. The fire leaned in the wind and seawater hissed in the burning wood. He watched it burn to coals. The embers glowed and faded and glowed, and bits of fire hobbled away down the beach into the darkness. He knew that he should wonder what was to become of him. And, um, you know, Bobby, Bobby ends up in kind of a such a position, almost a Western position in a life that's not fit for modernity that's been folded in for him. But why do I why do I think there's an optimism, a strain of really, really dark optimism? It's something that many people I think well, there's so many details in the book, it's very easy to miss them. The book opens uh with a with a suicide, which I could actually read. Um 
The book, I think the well, the book opens where the whole thing ends. It had snowed lightly in the night, and her frozen hair was gold and crystalline, and her eyes were frozen cold and hard as stones. One of her yellow boots had fallen off and stood in the snow beneath her. The shape of her coat lay dusted in the snow where she dropped in it, and she wore only a white dress, and she hung among the bare grey poles of the winter trees with her head bowed and her hands turned slightly outward like those of certain ecumenical statues whose attitudes asks that their history be considered, that the deep foundations of the world be considered where it has its being in the sorrow of her creatures. The hunter knelt and stogged his rifle upright in the snow behind him and took off his gloves and let them fall and fold his hands one upon the other. He thought that he should pray, but he had no prayer for such a thing. He bowed his head. Tower of ivory, he said, house of gold. He knelt there for a long time. When he opened his eyes, he saw a small shape half buried in the snow. He leaned and dusted away the snow and picked up a gold chain that held a steel key, a white gold ring. He slipped them into the pocket of his hunting coat. He'd heard the wind in the night. The wind's work. The trash can clattering over the bricks behind his house. The snow blowing out there in the forest in the dark. He looked up into those cold enameled eyes, glinting blue in the weak winter light. She tied her dress with a red sash so that she'd be found. Some bit of colour in the scrupulous desolation. On this Christmas day, it's cold and barely spoken Christmas day. Now, I haven't focused too much on Bobby and uh, Alicia. You know, their relationship that and all, it's difficult to articulate. But, you know, it's ongoing and he's worried about her and she's a genius that can't really be communicated with. And she's always on about how, um, and I think this goes, goes back to one of the pre-Socratics, you know, not being is one thing. Suicide and dying is one thing. But to never have been, you know, that's what she's on about the whole time. And so for her to for her to commit suicide somewhere like that, you know, in the snow, and to never be found is as close to never having been that she could have been. And she's always on about that. Um, but in that opening passage, we see something clear. That she tied a little red ribbon so she could be found because her brother was in a coma and she did it from getting my from getting my linearity right. And so she wanted to be found for his sake. And so throughout the whole novel, despite uh you know, despite everything, despite the fact the mystery might not there might not be any mystery at all. Uh despite the fact there never might be any mystery at all. Or if there is a mystery, you're not gonna work it out. Despite all of that. It's by the, the, the lack of the inability to communicate, the, the problems of language, the problems of these horrors, in, in spite of all of that, um, there is this love that was strange and, and odd and kind of shouldn't have been, but was pure. And eventually, you know, we open and end with this thing. That there was just enough there that she wanted to be found by her brother who loved her. Um, and then, you know, we we go through to something like Stella Maris, which I didn't want to talk about too much. Um, you know, it's all dialogue between Alicia and her therapist. And it's almost like she, did, she doesn't really want to be there. It's something for her to do. She's kind of bored, I think, and just wants something. Yeah, wants something to do. She goes, she goes there and enjoys talking to the other um, insane people. Um, and of everything, you know, the one part of her life she didn't seem to regret is Bobby. Amidst all this chaos, there's like this, amidst all this chaos, the one thing she found that anchoring was her brother, who she, who she, she deeply loved. Um, and Stella Maris reads like very close to a matter. I don't want to mention it as much in terms of the passenger because they are together. You read this afterwards and it, and it bolsters the passenger and makes you want to go, go back and read it. And it's kind of like an Ouroboros in a way. But also it reads like McCarthy's means to a almost like a manifesto of his scientific philosophical thoughts, his way to be like, here's, here's what I got, you know, I'm 89. Well, I know he would probably be more 88, 87 when it, maybe when it published or when it was final, the final draft was ready. You know, here's what I got, 87 years, um, here's my means to talk about it. And how, 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 who do I use to talk about it? I use a 20 year old schizophrenic polymath incestuous woman to talk about it um and i don't mean that you know i don't mean that offensively it's there you go you know that's <laughs> there's what i've got at the end of all things um and so there's not much more i can say about it. i mean i focused on 
the structure and the metatextual elements and everything being unfolded. And I hope that people will find something helpful in that of how to approach the novel. I haven't focused too much. I mean, there's there's so many other elements. There is a huge feminine current going through it that I still can't put my finger on of what femininity is or what it is to be a female for McCarthy. It's something very important there for him. You could read it for the science. You could read it for the love. You could read it for you could read it for, as a thriller if you really want it. You could read it as a postmodern novel. But I focused on on the way it's formed and its structure. Um, there's no way I could focus on all elements at once. So that is um, the Passenger and Stella Maris by Cormac McCarthy. Um, I hope you enjoyed my thoughts. Um, thanks very much for listening.